Julia Berghofer. I'm a policy fellow with the European Leadership Network, which is a think tank based in, in London and which covers a broad range uh, of topic, uh, topics, including uh, European and transatlantic security, as well as the relations between Russia and the West. So I'm, I'm very happy and honored to, to get a chance here to speak at this amazing conference about nuclear weapons and, and cyber risks. Um, it's maybe fair to say at the beginning that I'm not having a specific cyber background. Instead, my field of interest is rather nuclear arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation, as well as NATO and European security. So the reason why I want to talk to you about uh, cyber risks, risks for nuclear weapon systems today is that this is a highly under-addressed topic um, in the scientific as well as in the public and in the political sphere, whereby I think there is a clear evidence that cyber will become a key aspect when, it, uh, when we think about nuclear deterrence and strategic stability in the future. So I assume that, that most of you are, might not be familiar with nuclear deterrence and um, global stockpiles and NATO arrangements, and that's why I want to start with uh, some very basic about uh, nuclear weapons and, and stockpiles. Second part of my presentation will give you an idea of what do we actually um, understand as a cyber threat to nuclear weapon systems. The third part, I will walk you through some examples of cyber attacks that are directly or indirectly related to nuclear weapon systems. Um, the third part, uh, I will speak briefly about national awarenesses, and here the US and France will be uh, examples. And the last part will be dedicated to some policy recommendations on how we could enhance cyber security and resilience in the future. Now, um, let's have a look at some basic knowledge about nuclear weapons. As you can see in this slide, there are four categories of, of uh, states that possess nuclear weapons themselves or who host them on their soil. The first group um, is the so-called P5 states. These are the members of the UN Security Council, the US, Russia, China, France, and the United Kingdom, who legitimately possess nuclear weapons under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, or NPT. The NPT is an almost global um, treaty that um, allows only for these five states to, to possess nuclear weapons. The second group includes three states that never joined the NPT but run their own nuclear weapons program, bring, uh, programs, which is India, Pakistan and Israel. I put Israel in italics because it never publicly confirmed it has nuclear weapons, but it's quite clear that Israel has an arsenal. The third um, country is, some, is a country that made headlines uh, globally during the last month, in particular, which is North Korea. Um, the country joined the NPT in 1985 um, and unilaterally withdrew in 2003 in order to develop its own nuclear weapons program. And since there was no formal procedure to, to withdraw from the NPT, the DPRK is regarded as being in breach of the treaty. And last but not least, a very interesting, uh, interesting group of states that do not possess nuclear weapons themselves, but host in total about 200 to 250 US nuclear weapons on their soil due to the so-called NATO, NATO nuclear sharing arrangement, which is uh, basically a form of deterrence against Russia. Um, and this is, this is interesting because um, these weapons do not really belong to the countries, they just host them, which is um, Germany, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Turkey. So in the next slide, um, you can see how many warheads each of the nuclear weapon states holds um, by now, except for the NATO nuclear sharing countries. Um, the total number is about 15,000 nuclear weapons worldwide. Approximately 90% of them are in the hands of the US and Russia. Um, both of them have, have about 6,500 nuclear weapons. France and China have about 300. Um, India and Pakistan between 130 and 140. The UK a bit more than 200. Israel about 80 and North Korea is said to have about 50 nuclear weapons. So to better understand where there could be a threat coming from the cyber nuclear nexus, we should first understand what actually, um, what actually is a nuclear weapon system and what, uh, what are its um, components. So when I hear 
people talking about nuclear weapons, be it in politics uh, or in the media or even in the academic field, um, they sometimes only refer to one part of the nuclear weapon system, which is the nuclear weapon or the warhead itself. So you can see this on the left side of the slide. I put there a small WATA term, thermonuclear warhead uh, as an example. Um, or they just refer to um, the nuclear warhead and its delivery system, which is basically aircraft, ballistic and cruise missiles and drones. Maybe you heard about um, President Putin talking about developing a nuclear armed underwater drone. Um, but the nuclear weapon system itself includes far more. Um, there is, for example, the nuclear planning. In case of NATO, it's, for example, the nu nuclear planning group where all NATO states participate except for France. There are early warning system, which is usually a two-fold system made up of radar and satellites. Um, then we have, of course, the command and control centers. We have various communication channels and platforms like aircraft carriers and submarines, which you can see on the top right side. So this is, of course, a very simplified overview because there are, for example, a variety of different types of uh, missiles and aircrafts, etc., which I did not include in my presentation because that would take us uh, too far. So now coming um, to uh, the question, um, what actually poses a threat to nuclear weapon systems, maybe you've heard this famous quote by um, Donald Rumsfeld in 2002 where he basically said, sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And that's exactly what should make us absolutely nervous about nuclear cyber incidents, that we don't know what we don't know. So when we want to understand a threat, we have to look at different aspects. So the first question is, who are the potential actors who might be interested in carrying out a cyber attack against any nuclear weapon systems? There are researchers who stick to the point that when you want to cause a huge physical damage to your nuclear weapon system, you need to have vast resources, you need to have uh, capable personnel, and of course the knowledge. So it's easier for states to carry out um, these types of attacks than for individuals or non-state actor groups. Others uh, think that non-actor groups um, or non-state actor groups like terrorist groups or maybe organized crime groups might be more interested because they have nothing to lose in terms of reputation. But if we look, for example, at the Stuxnet attack, which was probably designed by the US and Israel um, to attack Iranian nuclear facilities, or, for example, at the US, who sent warnings uh, to the DPRK that it could infiltrate its nuclear weapon system, then we see that national actors do, in, in, uh, in fact, have a clear interest in carrying out cyber attacks as well, at least in theory. So second, what types of attacks do exist? Frankly speaking, there's not a clear uh, definition of cyber attacks in the nuclear sphere. So like in any other field, um, it could range from a sick, simple ha hacking to nuisance, cyber espionage, infiltration, infiltration sabotage, jamming and spoofing, uh, to physical damage, and on the top of the ladder, nuclear escalation. We also have to differentiate between an enabling and disabling attack. So an enabling attack means that a nuclear weapon might be launched inadvertently as a result of a fa false warning, for example. On the other hand, a disabling attack would hinder the launch of a nuclear weapon. And third, the possible targets of a cyber attack, and we will speak about this in a minute, is any part of the command and control and communication structure referred to as either C2 or C3, whether you, you take in communication or not as well as any stage within the nuclear supply chain, including power grids. So the next crucial question is, what are the possible implications for strategic stability between nation states, especially when we keep in mind that at least the Euro transatlantic community finds itself in kind of a renewed Cold War situation and key nuclear arms control treaties and agreements are about to fade away. Think only about the Iran deal and the INF treaty and maybe the New Star treaty as well in future. So even in a less tense situation than we face now, the very possibility of a cyber attack could undermine mutual trust and understanding and also progress in arms control globally. It could also undermine the trust in your own nuclear weapon system because you, you can never be sure it hasn't been compromised yet. 
It could also contribute to lowering the threshold for escalation, of course. And here we have the serious problem of uh, the attribution of a cyber attack, like in any other field. But despite of all this, um, when we look at nuclear deterrence as a concept, um, as long as there are, um, well, the, the implications are that grave in the short or midterm uh, on nuclear deterrence as a concept, which means that as long as there is not a definite trend towards a Maya cyber attacks, um, nuclear deterrence as the primary security guarantee for nation state will not be undermined. Nor will state start to, to immediately disarm because they think there could be uh, cyber attacks in the future. But still, as I mentioned uh, above, there will be possibly a harmful effect on mutual trust and understanding, and nuclear deterrence might get less foreseeable and, might all, uh, and, and possibly less controllable. So that means we couldn't keep on relying on historic knowledge about nuclear deterrence um, and how it works in the best case and in an ideal setting, but in states, states will always have to, to include cyber in their national planning in the future. So with the next two slides, I would like to give you an idea of where the nuclear command, command control and communication systems, as well as the nuclear supply chain, are vulnerable to a possible cyber attack. And please keep in mind um, what I, what I that I mentioned there's a variety of possible types of uh, attacks. So this will never be an exhaustive list, of course. Um, but rather the, the, the attempt to make the threat more understandable for you and to give you uh, some more concrete examples. So you can see the red arrows in the, in the slide. Um, each of them symbolizes a cyber attack or maybe a malware infiltration. Um, the boxes and the symbols are different parts of the nuclear weapons uh, system, as we already know it from the slide at the beginning. Another question is what, what could happen possibly? Something that could be done rather easily is that communication between key actors is being disrupted or disabled. For example, communication between senior military leaders in the command and control centers could be disrupted um, or between a national command and control and its counterpart in, in allied countries. This applies mostly to, to NATO countries. The whole nuclear planning structure could be compromised um, for example, if they don't get vital information about their own system or uh, about, uh, for example, about incoming threat from, from adversaries. And communication channels with uh, de delivery systems and platforms could be disrupted as well. So another scenario is that there is a false warning of attack thanks to cyber spoofing. This is very crucial, that's why I put it in red. Um, if, for example, the radar sends a warning to the command and control that there is a, is a missile flying over to, to a country, there might be not enough time to, to wait for sufficient additional data coming from satellites. So this could force a state to, to answer by launching a nuclear, what, what the state thinks is a nuclear second strike, but in fact is a nuclear first strike. Next scenario is uh, that the security system which keeps warheads, missiles, aircraft, etc., safe and secure get compromised. Think about a possible theft of a warhead. And of course, an attack does not have to be carried out remotely, but could also come from an insider, whether uh, he does that deliberately or not. And one last very frightening scenario is that another state or maybe a state-sponsored group um, gets access to an adversary's nuclear weapon systems and, and gets control over their nuclear weapons and authorizes a launch um, remotely. So the other sensitive area is the whole nuclear weapon supply chain. The supply chain could be infiltrated at any stage. A potential attacker will always strive to find the weakest link in the supply chain. So you can see the different phases, again, very simplified um, to make it less complex in the slide. The supply chain um, can be compromised at a very early stage, namely the, the system architectures and the design process. For example, a computer chip could get compromised so that hackers could later exfiltrate uh, data from the chip while the chip itself seems to function normally. So computer chips are indeed a very interesting example in this, in this case because most of the countries do not produce them uh, themselves in the national defense unit but instead purchase them from the global markets. That's 
that's uh, highly crucial here. Um, attacks on manufacturers and private firms can potentially include efforts to steal data, to corrupt data, to sabotage equipment, and to disable networks. And although um, attacks like the Stuxnet attack and, and the WannaCry ransom were, are to date very rare examples of successful and serious attacks, the complexities and interdependencies within the supply chain are on the rise, um, which in fact means that risks are multiplying um, constantly. And on the level of state-run nuclear weapons programs, if we're on the next stage, remote interference plays an important role, but also insider threat threats, as we, as we saw in the, in the last slide, either they are deliberately carried out or not. Um, and a further critical stage is the process of maintenance, um, upgrades and modernization, because um, of course uh, nuclear weapons have to be kept as modern, as safe, as safe and secure as they could, but at the same time the more sophisticated a system gets, the more vulnerable it is to attacks. So we always think we make them more safe and more secure once we modernize them, but at the same time it, it carries huge risks for us. And of course the power grid could also be infiltrated. So maybe you still think that a cyber attack on nuclear or nuclear related systems are a bit too fictional. So to dispel your doubts a bit, let me give you some examples. Um, the first one uh, is uh, that the computer screen of a nuclear watch officer, say in the US, indicates that one or more Russian um, intercontinental ballistic missiles are about to hit any target in the United States. So how could the officer be sure that this is not just cyber spoofing and more importantly, how will this respond uh, how will this res person respond taking into account the very short time for a decision? So something similar happened, maybe you remember that, back in 1983 when a random Soviet officer was confronted with five or more um, US ICBMs flying over um, to Russia and he decided not to authorize uh, a counterattack and of course this was just in a computer error at that time but it's just, it's pretty conceivable that a similar effect could be caused deliberately um, by a cyber attack. Another scenario is that um, military officials are not able to communicate with their personal controlling the nuclear uh, weapons during an international crisis. So what would they think had happened and how will they respond? So again, the question, is that plausible? Um, there was a similar incident um, back in 2010 when American launch control officers have lost for the whole time of 45 minutes communication with a squadron of 50 nuclear-tipped ICBMs in Wyoming. So this too was the result of a technical malfunction, but here again it's possible that a corresponding effect could be caused deliberately by a cyber attack. And also in general, if officials discover malware on a nuclear critical system and they suspect that this was just a tip of the, well, the cyber iceberg, how will they react? What would they think? Um, and this is the reason why the US um, National Nuclear Security Administration stated um, two years ago, the trend toward a non-domestic supply chain for components of nuclear weapons and related systems may pose risks to these weapons and systems. So this indicates very clearly that they are aware of the risk, at least in the US. So, do you still have doubts? If so, please uh, look at a picture. I think you will clearly remember that. Um, that was a computer error a few months ago um, that shocked Hawaii during uh, the very height of the North Korean crisis when Hawaiians thought a ballistic missile was flying over to, to them. So in the third part of my presentation, I will talk about some cyber attacks on directly or indirectly nuclear-related systems that happened in the past years. And again, that's not an exhaustive list, it's just uh, a couple of, of examples that might be interesting for you. So I will start with what uh, New York Times columnist David Sanger described as the most sophisticated cyber weapon ever developed. 
And this was the Stuxnet worm attack, which emerged in 2010 and targeted some 15 Iranian nuclear facilities, including uh, the Natanz, that's one of the key uh, Iranian uh, nuclear facilities. You can see a satellite picture on the bottom right side from 2003. Um, Stuxnet infiltrated numerous computer systems targeting the Windows-based Step 7 uh, software, and it was highly invasive. And what it made it so, so destructive was just its ability to replicate itself. And as a consequence, about more than 980 uranium-enriching centrifuges in Iran started destroying themselves. So the designers are still being unknown uh, officially, but there's a strong indication that this uh, was a warm attack designed by the US and Israel, who both had an interest in halting Iran's clandestine nuclear weapons program. So I mentioned earlier in my presentation that private sector companies pose a risk because they could become the weak link in a supply chain. A number of cyber attacks were carried out against private, private firms during the last years, and some of them were made public, which is, not, um, which is not so usual because normally tech firms are not so interested in, in making these things public because uh, of the fear of reputational lo uh, loss. Um, but we know of some attacks, including uh, against General Motors, Boeing, and Lockheed Martin. So Lockheed Martin um, is an interesting example. It fell victim to a cyber attack back in 2011, apparently conducted by um, Chinese businessmen. And uh, Lockheed Martin developed, for example, the F-35 Lightning II and the F-16 aircraft. It sells anti-ballistic missile defense systems. It provides unmanned and um, autonomous systems, missiles, submarines, radar sensors, etc. So to take the F-35 uh, aircraft as an example, it is not nuclear capable yet, but there are plans to develop a nuclear capable F-35 in the future, which might be purchased by, by European states that host American nuclear weapons as well. Um, another example, being asked whether there has been any uh, and now coming back to, to Lockheed Martin, they were asked whether there has been any serious damage following the attack, and Lockheed Martin just stated um, shortly after the attack was made public that their systems remain secure, that no customer program or employee personal data has been compromised. But from my perspective, we could never be sure that this is true. So another concerning issue to fighter aircraft is the statement that German Defense Minister Ursula von der Leyen made uh, during the Munich Security Conference this year. And she said, while it may be hard to use a missile to, to actually shoot down a Eurofighter Typhoon, which is, by the way, an aircraft developed by Germany, Italy, Spain, and the UK. And she said, it is relatively easy to bring one down through a simple hacking. Um, the Eurofighter ty Typhoon, again, is not nuclear capable yet, but a new Eurofighter model, which will be developed uh, jointly by Germany and France, could be. And the question here remains as to whether this model will be safe and secure um, regarding cyber attacks. So my third slide on uh, examples for cyber vulnerabilities and attacks um, on specific systems is about UK's nuclear weapons system called Trident and the terminal high altitude area defense system called TART. So you might know um, there are concerns of whether UK's nuclear deterrent, which fully relies on four Vanguard-class um, submarines, could be highly vulnerable to a major hacking attack. So each of these submarines um, carries eight Trident II uh, sea-launched ballistic missiles and up to 40 warheads. And one reason for concern is that the Submarine Command System's updated version is based upon a version of Windows XP, which has been installed on all active Royal, class, uh, Royal Navy submarine classes. And the Windows XP, as you certainly know, was the operating system which was targeted by the WannaCry ransomware in May 2017 that also disrupted parts of the National Health Service and other companies worldwide. For example, it halted production at a Honda car plant in Japan. So for a certain time, systems like Trident were perceived as being fully safe and secure because submarines are air-gapped once they've submerged. But this is not true for two simple reasons. 
First, the submarine is, um, of course, not always below the surface, and, and breaches could happen during maintenance once the submarine is stocked. And second, air gapping could be easily co overcome through an affected USB th drive, for example, like it happened with the Natanz nuclear facility, which was, which was air gapped during the time when the Stuxnet attack happened. Now, if you look at the bottom uh, left side of the slide, you can see the TART system, which is a US-developed anti-ballistic missile system uh, developed by Raytheon and Lockheed Martin uh, Space Systems Company and currently de deployed in Guam and South Korea. So in 2017, the US security firm FireEye announced that it believes TART has been hacked by a state-sponsored uh, Chinese group. So a, sp a, state, a spokesperson with the uh, South Korea's Ministry of Foreign Affairs confirmed that there has indeed been an attempted cyber attack on the systems originating from China, but they wouldn't confirm that TARD was targeted in particular. And um, recently I just noticed something that, uh, was, uh, that did not happen last night, but it was revealed last night, which was um, the data of a uh, um, French construction company called uh, Ingerop, or Ingerop, I don't know how, it, how it's pronounced, um, has been stolen, and apparently about 11,000 um, data files have been stolen from that company, which builds, for example, um, nuclear power plants uh, and prisons. So I will go through the next slides uh, very quickly um, due to time reasons. So the next two slides address the awareness for cyber threats from two national perspectives, and I took U.S. and France um, as examples here because uh, in the U.S. Um, they are very aware of the cyber threat for their nuclear weapon systems. They are quite apparent about their nuclear weapons and about uh, their concerns per se. And I put together just a couple of notes, for, uh, quotes from public sources. The first is from the retired General Robert Kaler, who was uh, the commander of the US Stratcom, which is responsible for their nuclear weapons. And he um, said, being asked by the Senate Armed Services Committee in 2013, we are very concerned with the potential of, cyber, uh, of a cyber-related attack on our nuclear command and control and on the weapon systems themselves. Um, and as a result, in 2017, a task force on cyber deterrence made a recommendation um, to conduct an annual assessment of the cyber resilience of uh, the US nuclear deterrent, including all essential nuclear thin line components, which means NC3 platforms, delivery systems, and warheads. And also in April uh, 2017, um, the Air Force General John Hyden, who is now the commander of the US Stratcom, um, said, I see a top tier cyber threat being Russia and China in particular, because they have the ability to threaten the existence of this nation. So you can see there is a very clear understanding that cyber could become a major risk to the nuclear weapon system in the US. Now in France, the situation is a bit different and that's why I put this as the second example. As I, f n as I know from a few uh, French researchers and officials, there is no public debate and even the recent cyber strategy from 2018 does not address the cyber nuclear nexus directly, rather indirectly. Um, but as far as I learned, despite the, that there is no political and public debate, military staff and government officials on the top levels are indeed aware of the threat. Um, but in France, like you probably know, the general attitude is n not to talk too open openly about nuclear weapons uh, in, in general. And so it is the case with the vulnerabilities. But indeed, France faced also um, some uh, crucial, crucial cyber attacks. The first one was in 2009, where the Marine Nationale was exposed to, to a cyber attack, which was called the Config Worm, and it struck important systems uh, preventing operative units to, to download their flight plans because uh, databases were infected. And another example is that a French nuclear company called Areva has been targeted by a cyber espionage campaign back in 2011. So now to, to coming, coming to the, the last part of my presentation and 
um, talking about what, what can be done to enhance security and resilience within crucial parts of the nuclear weapon system like the NC3 and the supply chain, I want to look at some policy recommendations in this last section. So given the complexity of the threat and taking into account that um, quite often we don't know what we don't know, as we heard earlier, we have to carefully look at some key aspects before developing any measures. So first, as long as we know that nuclear weapons exist as, and as long as they serve as the primary security guarantees of some states and alliances like NATO, the very threat of a major cyber attack can never be ruled out. And because systems tend to be modernized and get increasingly sophisticated and complex, they tend to be more vulnerable in the future. And second, the threat of a cyber attack against any nuclear we weapon system is always global. It's, it's never just the national perspective. And therefore, any effective measure has to be taken on a bilateral or even on a multilateral basis. And third, cross-sector exchange and sharing of information is of crucial importance. This includes governments, the military leaders, the private sector, but also academia, think tanks, international institutions like the UN, and civil society, because civil society could bring the topic to their respective governments. Now looking at a couple of concrete steps, and here again, this is just uh, some recommendations, some possible measures, and not an exhaustive list. Um, First, I think, um, especially when we look at NATO as an alliance, we need to develop a common view and uh, a first interpretation of what actually is the threat, and we need to formulate an appropriate political or military response vis-a-vis -vis a possible cyber attack. Nations, uh, national, uh, national states per se must develop a narrative why cybersecurity is crucial for their nuclear weapon systems, and they should refrain from thinking that a major attack on their nuclear weapon system is not uh, possible. And we need to have something like a permanent cyber nuclear task force, which is made up of um, senior military leaders, government officials, uh, and top level experts coming either from uh, or both from the nuclear policy and from the cyber security side to, to share information, to exchange views, and to develop best practice models. And of course, as we face a major crisis, now we need to have bilateral measures between the US and Russia, because evidently they are the biggest nuclear weapons possessors. We need to keep open communications channels or re-establish them. We need to seek for mutual understanding and an exchange of views on cyber-related nuclear threats here. And also more, this is done very, that, that's a very sensitive and difficult area, but we need more transparency on cyber vulnerabilities and nuclear weapon systems in general. So this is, for example, important when we look at the NATO nuclear sharing arrangements um, in Europe and uh, on US nuclear modernization plans. And to, to illuminate this a bit, I put in another slides, a slide about the NATO nuclear sharing in Europe. Because here you can see clearly that we have three distinct entities. First, you have the NATO command and control, where 29 countries uh, have a say. Then we have US nuclear weapons and five European countries. And you can see, um, I put in this little picture of the, the modernization plan of the B-61 bomb. So in the future, we will have the B-61-12 um, model, which is basically a combination of four existing B-61 uh, bombs. And this will be a very sophisticated and complex model. So as we already know, the more complex a system gets, uh, the more vulnerable it is. And last, we have national aircraft in four European states, which is Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Italy. Turkey doesn't possess um, dual-capable um, aircraft. So um, coming to some uh, very final recommendations, um, private firms, we heard that this is a very crucial factor, must provide information to their respective national authorities and also to research institutions about possible hacks and vulnerabilities in order to, to improve supply chain security and resilience in the future. We absolutely need to, to establish better education and, and training for military staff at any level. 
Um, and since I'm coming from the academic uh, side, I think that more uh, masters and PhD programs should focus on the cyber nuclear nexus because we certainly lack of, of knowledge here, uh, especially among younger people. And we need a better exchange between university, research and military institutions. And finally, we need to establish additional uh, projects and programs within institutions like uh, the UN, uh, EU, um, CBRN, Centers of Excellence, and the like, and new institutional structures focusing on the cyber nuclear threat. So if you are further interested in a topic, and um, unfortunately there are to date few researchers who focus exactly on that, um, I can recommend this uh, excellent publications. And Rufato, the first one, for example, is a dear colleague of mine, and he has done incredible research in this area. Um, and also the Chatham House and the NTI publications are worth reading. So last but not least, thank you for, uh, for your attention. And there is no Q&A session due to time limits, but if you want to, to um, talk about this, please feel free to approach me and we can talk about this on a bilateral basis. Thank you.